I never knew inspiration was a problem before, did you? There's the title, The Problem of Inspiration. I call it The Problem of Inspiration because how we understand that shapes everything in relationship to our subject or our theme, our series on a reasonable faith. Now, when I say a reasoned or reasonable faith, that's what I mean. I don't mean a sort of rationalistic kind of thinking about faith that was made popular in the Enlightenment. For those of you who know philosophy, I'm not thinking of a Kantian kind of um, reason. I'm thinking of reason as in the broader spectrum of reasonableness. That is to say, it takes into account not just logic, but it takes into account learning and, and our social situation. It takes into account uh, the world in which we live. It takes into account a studied or a reasoned read of Scripture. We run into problems really quickly if we're not careful. And so we need to think through what we mean when we say a reasoned faith and what we mean when we talk about inspiration. But before I get too far into all of that, I just want to reflect a couple of ideas that I think might be useful to us as kind of a preamble. First, let's talk about what we know about God. I think if we took a survey and interviewed you and then put the interviews up in little snippets, we would find that there's a wide range in this room of thinking about who God is. A wide range. Some of the thoughts would be very classic Adventist, whatever that means. Some of them might be a little less classic. Some of them might be very um, heavily authority-oriented. Some of them might be very freewheeling. I don't know. But it would be interesting to take that survey. And so I just mention that because I take a tremendous risk when I bring these subjects up with you. A, that I might confuse you, God help me. And B, that I might actually draw out something in yourself that's contradictory or disagreement. I'm not doing this to create discord. I'm doing this to help us move in a direction toward a reasoned and reasonable faith. Is that, is that, are we on the same page with that? Um, okay, so let's just start, start with the idea of God for a minute. We have a wonderful idea of God that comes to us from inspiration. For God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Anybody heard that before? Raise your hand if you've heard that before. Now, we typically take that and we apply the word unchanging to it, don't we? Okay, but then we start reading in the story of the Exodus, and we read how Moses went before Pharaoh. And in part of the passages, we read that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and in part of the same passages, we read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Which was it? Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Or did Pharaoh harden Pharaoh's heart? The text says both. You say to me, well, what does this have to do with God changing or not changing? Comes back to the question of inspiration. What are we reading when we read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Let's just take that quickly down the aside, down the rabbit hole, and see where it goes. If God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God is asking of Pharaoh through Moses a favor, let my people go. God asks the favor and then turns Pharaoh internally against that favor so that Pharaoh says no, as if Pharaoh has no choice in the matter. Then God turns around and punishes all of Egypt for Pharaoh's refusal to let God's people go. And then God ultimately kills all of the firstborn of Egypt for Pharaoh, who was hardened by God against saying yes, 
Now God kills all the firstborn of Egypt. Is this an appealing image of God for you? Is this compelling? I'm listening. It's compelling, all right. The wrong direction compelling. Is that what I hear you saying there? Now, I bring this up because we read these stories in Scripture. We read Scripture all the time, and we're not sure what we're reading or how we're going to read it. But if we follow that down the rabbit hole, we come to some very unhappy things very quickly. Because God all of a sudden cannot escape a label that not only agrees with the accusation made against him in the great controversy, he's not just and he's not fair. Okay, First of all, that is it. in no human sphere could that be understood to be just or fair. You can say, well, pastor, it's beyond our understanding. That's beyond rationality. And now we're to a faith that, again, is just based on something completely random and irrational and doesn't communicate well to the world around us, does it? How do you communicate that kind of irrational faith to the world around you? So then we go to the other side and we say, well, that isn't um, maybe accurate. What if Pharaoh hardens his own heart, as the other half of the passage implies? That's, That's fine. We escape now the problem of God's capriciousness in this situation, but we're still stuck with what to do with the passages where it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Maybe we slip just over one step to the question of knowledge and free will. Maybe Pharaoh is, in fact, free to harden his own heart or make a choice, but when the text indicates God hardened Pharaoh's heart, maybe the text is indicating God knew Pharaoh would harden his heart. Now, you could say to me, but pastor, why doesn't it say that? Good question. Don't have an answer for you except that the writer of Exodus isn't trying to do theology, not in the way we do. The writer of this story might have an entirely other purpose than for us to discuss whether God is reasonable and fair and just, might have a whole other purpose in writing this story than whether or not we're going to go down that rabbit hole and decide whether God is capricious or not. The author of this story might be trying to relate a heritage piece of salvation history that has many implications for what will come later in Jesus Christ. Was that said too difficult in too difficult a way, or did you follow me? I'll try it again. That was a tough sentence. Maybe the writer is telling us a story that's a precursor of something we're going to recognize in the life of Jesus. Maybe Egypt becomes for us in our read of this a metaphor for captivity and slavery. And what does Paul tell us about captivity and slavery? If you've sinned, and all have and fallen short of the glory of God, what are you? A slave. You are a slave to sin and death. But thanks be to Christ who delivers us from both. Moses leads God's people out of slavery and death in Egypt. Christ leads us out of slavery and death to sin to life. Is that maybe more useful? Uh, You're thinking about it. It's okay. When we talk about the life of God, I hear many people say when we say he doesn't change yesterday to tomorrow, that in fact he knows everything, including everything that's going to be, from yesterday to eternity. But now let's think about the implications for that. Reasonable faith, right? Let's just, let's just a, a, a look at that critically for a moment. If God knows everything, period, beginning to end, everything that's going to be, everything you're going to do, what's the difference between you hardening your own heart and his hardening your heart? Functionally, there's no difference, is there? Now I'm going to get into deep water, into trouble here pretty quick, right? Because you're going to say to me, Pastor, you don't think God knows everything? 
And I'm going to tell you that if he knows everything, past, present, and future, does he, what variation can there be? If everything is known in, its, in the form in which it will take place, factually, what variation can there be? None. If there can be no variation then, is God living in a static universe within himself and outside of himself, or is he living in a dynamic universe within himself and outside himself? I think what I'm driving at is it's a static universe. It could be both because you could understand the dynamism that's part of the unfolding of everything he knows to be a sort of internal dynamism. But if it's already known, is there anything novel to God? No. Can there be any sort of surprise in God's universe? No. Now let's go to the problem of sin. If that is who God is, was sin a surprise? It was known in the mind of God. Did Jesus take any risk at all in coming to be with us? How so? If God already knew the outcome, if God already knew the outcome, if God knew that Christ would succeed, if God knew that Christ would succeed in conquering sin and death, if God knew that he was going to resurrect him at that time, what risk was really taken? If from all of time it was determined and for all of the future it was determined that Christ would take on fleshly form, what risk was there? None. And yet I heard so many of you say, oh, he took a risk. It's because part of our story doesn't line up with another part of our story. If you're playing chess and you know one move at a time and it's the only way you know to play, how smart are you if you've memorized every move of a particular chess game? Pretty smart. Smarter than your average rat. Okay? How smart are you if you could anticipate all one million options for play on the board and knew every possible game on the board? Now how smart are you? Pretty smart. Bobby Fischer, the great chess player, had memorized 52 complete games. Does that give you an idea? Now, I'm not saying this is a perfect analogy for who God is, but I'm wondering if we want to move God away from the one game of chess in which everything is known and played out, that side of the board over to the side of the board that says God knows every possibility and potentiality. How about that one? Maybe a little better? Why am I doing this to you? Is this preaching? Is this teaching? Is it inspiration? Is it a failure? Why am I doing this to you? I'm challenging you. I'm trying to help you think because you have an image of God that's derived from Scripture and an image of God that you project back into your interpretation of Scripture. You have an image of God that you have received from inspiration and you seek current, live inspiration from God as you go back to read the very scriptures that we say he inspired. You have a dynamic relationship with life and God, and yet sometimes we think of God as static, unmoving, immovable. We think of God that way. What if we thought of God differently? What if we thought of God as the greatest being that ever could be? which he is, she is. What if we thought of God as dynamic, interacting with reality? What if we thought of God as moving rather than as a God who moved? Does that open up any possibilities for you in your life? Is it possible maybe that the Spirit that spoke could be the spirit that speaks? 
Is it possible that the God who created the world by word can recreate it by word and has done so in Jesus Christ, the word? I don't see you. What if God were the most dynamic, responsive, creative, vital, invigorating force in the universe? What if God's love was so dynamic that it was constantly seeking the best way to speak to you? What would that look like? I'm going to suggest it would look like our scriptures because God doesn't speak to each of the writers of the Bible the same way. He doesn't even give them the same message. And in some times, these messages don't even seem to line up perfectly. So now we get to the problem of inspiration. And when we think about a reasonable faith, you see what we want to lock ourselves down to, and we get into all kinds of trouble with it, we want to lock ourselves into a reductionism. We want to lock ourselves into a reductionism. What I mean by that is we want to take a course in relationship to inspiration and inspiration's relationship to truth and teaching and everything else that means that it can only be understood one way. So we get into tremendous trouble very quickly with that definition. So let's just take a couple of quick examples that I can just pull up from uh, my history. Uh, Everybody here heard of Ellen G. White? Okay. Prophetess. Now, I'm not going to take a poll and ask how many of you believe that she was a prophetess. I'm not going to take a poll and see how many of you believe she was inspired. I'm simply going to make this statement. I believe she functioned as both. Very clearly, she played a prophetic role in the formation and direction of our early church. If you look at her work and the work of the prophets of old, there are many, 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 many ties and similarities. She played a prophetic role in our church. To me, that's indisputable. Was she inspired? Absolutely. But now what does that mean? Is she inspired to a degree or in a way that others are not? What does it mean in her prophetic role if she says something and later contradicts it? You see, what we want to do is we want to take a category of inspiration and move it over into a category we call absolute truth. I have a a little clue for you here based on our discussion of God just a minute ago. God is eternal and unchanging in the sense that He is the one who has been, is, and forever will be. And He is the embodiment of everything that is true. God in His person is truth, capital T. You see, and there's no distinction of truths with God. He lives in the reality of all truth, whatever its source or origin. Now, I want you to think for just a minute about your own development, and let me ask you something. How many of you still have baby teeth? Raise your hands high if you still have your baby teeth. Okay. Is it true that you once had baby teeth? Was it you when you had baby teeth? It's true that it was still you when you had baby teeth. And was it true that you had baby teeth? Yes. Is it true now that you have adult teeth and that those are different from baby teeth? Is it true that some of you don't have all your teeth? Is it true that some of you don't have any teeth at all? 
See, all of these things are true, but they're not all the same. They're not all the same. Ellen White was a little girl with baby teeth, and then she became a woman with adult teeth. When she wrote as a teenager, she came up with things that were different because of her phase in life and her maturity than what she came up with when she was 40 or 80. Because the truth I lived in at 18 is not the truth I lived in at 30, or the truth I lived in at 40, or the truth... Well, that's where I stop. (laughs) I, like many of you, have had a very significant birthday lately. And um, I keep, every decade, I keep saying, well, I've reached the halfway point. I guess pretty soon I'm going to have to be living to 120 to be able to say that just definitively. What's true for me today is not necessarily what was true for me 30 years ago. Can any of you relate to that statement? So why then do we want to make it such that because Ellen White said something at 25 that she changed when she was 60, that one is true and the other is not? Why? Can we not look at this as inspiration as opposed to truth and say that she wrote and fulfilled a prophetic role at that time as best as she could and came up with something that was different. Maybe she matured. Maybe it was better than she, what she wrote later. Have any of you find yourself more open as you get older? More relaxed, more forgiving? How many of you are more open, more relaxed, more forgiving as you get a little older? How many of you think that's a bad thing? I don't see a single hand. Your reality is shifting as you age, as you mature, your perspective has changed. Are you living any more truth or less truth now than you were when you were acting and believing with integrity 30 years ago? No, you've always tried to live truth. Now, I'm not suggesting that truth is anything you think it is, okay? There's a reason we mature. We grow into hopefully greater truth. We grow ever more like God through sanctification, through our faith, through our study of God. By beholding, we become changed. So hopefully as we behold through the years, we move ever toward a likeness of the one who created us, yes? But we've got to get rid of this idea that somehow... What was said here has to be locked in. So Ellen White made statements. I remember having a conversation with the president of a conference. Blew my mind. I raised an instance in which I thought what Ellen White had to say was not in harmony with the larger scientific and uh, social science community. And the president said to me, Greg, one day science will prove her right. I was incredulous. For him, in order for her to be inspired, what she said about that particular idea or subject had to be true for all time. That's a tough life to live. What if she spoke prophetically and there was value to what she said but it doesn't match with science or social science. Do we have to insist that there's a rightness or a truth there at the expense of everything else? Is that a reasoned faith? I don't think so. I think, my friends, if we look at God dynamically and we look at our own lives dynamically, it's about a trajectory, isn't it? It's about a journey towards something. It's about faith and truth and life as we understand it now with the different bits of knowledge that we have now. I've lost you, I think. Or am I making you think? Is that painful? It is for me sometimes. I walk out and I go, oh man, I have a headache. Processing this stuff is hard work. Thinking about how we line things up is hard. It can be threatening and leave us feeling insecure. If God isn't how I thought God might be, what does that mean for me? Have I got it wrong? 
Does that mean that maybe if I'm wrong, there isn't the God I think there is? Has my apprehension or missing? Maybe the pastor's just all wrong. Why is the pastor teaching all these terrible lies? I don't know what you're thinking. I'm just processing with you a minute. So let's go to our text and just draw a few things from these that are valuable. We'll start in the last one, the Second Timothy passage. Second Timothy chapter 3. And I was going through 14 to 17, but I'm going to start... with a note on three. There's a certain forecasting happening here. Apocalyptic sort of forecasting. Verse 12 bears it out. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So that's the context. Then he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and what you've become convinced of. What you've learned and what you've become convinced of. Continue in it. That's because you know those from who you learned it. So part of the proof of the pudding for Paul was, what is the life and story of the one who taught you? What is the relationship to God of the one who taught you? What kind of relationship with Jesus does the one who taught you have? That's what he's saying there. This is part of what makes something sure. And how from infancy you've known the Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul isn't speaking here of the stages of development. He's not talking about the movement from, you know, being a toddler to being a preschooler to being a grade schooler. He's not talking about education per se. He's not talking about physical development per se. What is he talking about? We have a foundation in stories from people who have experience of God relayed through Scripture and relayed in the present, which are able to make us wise through salvation, for salvation through Jesus Christ. And here's the the clincher. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What's the outcome? You become wise unto salvation and equipped for good work. That's the outcome that we're looking for. There's nothing else there. You become wise for salvation and equipped to do every good work. That's the purpose of teaching. It's going to trim you, train you, teach you mature you, grow you. So what is the view of inspiration here? Paul is, or or the writer of Timothy, is unequivocal, right? All Scripture is God-breathed. I love that word. Let's just take that word for a moment. God-breathed. Pneuma, breath, spirit, energy of life. You see, when God created, this is a reference to creation. In Genesis 2, when God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living being, that God breathing right there is what's being talked about. As God bent over the form of Adam and breathed into him life, breath, pneuma, spirit, as God gave body spirit, Adam rises to being a living being or soul, nefesh. It's beautiful. And as God breathes life into each of us through His teachings, through His Word, we become again living beings. All Scripture is inspired so that you might come alive so that you might make this journey, so that you might move from the stories of infancy to a complete work, the work God gave you to do, having found your purpose and your salvation in Jesus Christ. It's deep, isn't it? 
almost unfathomably deep what God wants for us. You see, the fact that Scripture is God-breathed doesn't mean that we have to take every little bit of it literally. In fact, we shouldn't. Last week, we discussed how there were different kinds of literature. Right? A poetic metaphor, when you read that, you don't take it literally, do you? Go home and read Song of Songs and then see if you're going to take all of that literally. Really, your hair is like that of a goat? Your neck is like an ivory tower? Your teeth are like ram's horns or whatever it said. I mean, you know, it's metaphor. It's poetic metaphor. We're all, we, we get that really quickly. And yet we get confused with other things. Think about some of the stuff our church has struggled with lately. We've struggled, struggled, struggled. Since 1980, we've struggled with the ordination of women and before. And yet, historically, there were women pastors in the time of Ellen White. Historically, she wasn't opposed to ordination. Historically, who we were embraced women in ministry. Somehow, culturally, we lost track of that. Somehow, we became a group that didn't, didn't affirm that anymore. And now we've had to spend 35 years digging through Scripture to try to figure it out. I think we could have skipped the scriptures and gone straight to the Constitution of the United States and understood God far better. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. Well, the framers of our Constitution may not have been as gender-inclusive as they might have been, but we're going to put it this way, all human beings were created equal. Now, what does that do for us? Let me ask you a question. Is that document inspired? So I love it. So many of you say, yes, of course it is. It is. Because it moves us in a direction that is more loving, generous, inclusive, egalitarian, thoughtful, takes better advantage of the wealth of human resource, it's respectful. Everything that we would claim as an ideal, it moves us forward in that, right? Why would we wrestle for 35 years with this subject? We wrestle with it because we're still not sure how to relate to inspiration. We still want to say that if it was inspired or that if it moved a group of people or spoke to a particular people at a particular time, we must understand it literally in the same sort of way or different way today. We, and we don't. We don't have to do that. Timothy's right. It's all there to shape, to shave, but it's part of a dynamic God who relates to a dynamic universe and a dynamic struggle over history to individuals who are dynamic in the world today, you and I. You see, when we pray, and I'm going to conclude here. I know I keep, I'm, I'm talking a lot today. I'm on a roll. When we pray, what do we expect to happen? We expect an answer. When we pray, we are looking for many things. We might be looking for God to do a work in us, to quiet us, or to help us, or to help us think through something, or reframe something, or solve a problem. We might be looking for God to forgive us and alleviate our guilt, to heal us from a particular affliction. It could be psychological. It could be an addiction. It could be something in our bodies. It could be wrong thinking. It could be aggression. It could be any number of things. And when we think about what we pray for others, what do we want to have happened? I gathered myself with a family of one of our members at a bedside at a hospital this week. Cancer. And the prayer fervently was, Lord, bring healing. We want God 
to step into our world and in a way that's miraculous, change reality. A static God can't do that. A dynamic God can. A dynamic God is a God who can respond to you in a way that's novel. Now, we can go back to our static universe and it can feel like God is responding to us or not responding to us in the reality, the one that we live out that he already knows everything about. I have to grant you that. But I don't find that terribly helpful. If I'm looking for God to breathe into me life and to redeem my life now, I need his spirit. I need his in. Inspiration. Spire is the Latin for breathe. I need to be a God-breathed creature. Alive by virtue of the breath God gave me when I was born and alive by virtue of the breath or spirit God blows into my life today. Have you ever heard anybody say, wow, that was a breath of fresh air? What a wonderful colloquial way of saying, wow, that was inspiring. That gave me life. What did Jesus do? He made it very plain, and I'm going to quit with this. Jesus said, I come to give you what? Life. And life what? Yes. Do you think Jesus meant it? I do. I think he meant it. Inspiration and Scripture are there to give you life. That should guide your read of Scripture. That should guide what you take home. That should guide the way you parse things. Because sometimes I hear people talking about what the Scriptures say, and it is a dead end that does not lead to life. It does not give life. When people interpret the scriptures to mean, women, really, cover your heads, shut up, and sit in the balcony. You should never speak or teach, speak to or teach a man. When that's what scripture is teaching, ladies, do you find that life affirming? I didn't hear you. Did you find that life giving? Did you find that edifying and building you up? Did you find it inspiring? Did you find it inspired? No. No. It may have worked for a particular people at a particular time, in a particular place, in a particular culture. It's not about true and false. Where is spirit and life now in relationship to the Scriptures? I'll tell you where it is. Paul says it. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Maybe there's more life there. Where are you going to find it? Well, I hope this morning I've made it better, not worse. I know that this is going to be a big challenge for some of you. I know some of you are going to want to attempt to attribute it to a particular way of theology that's in the world today or a particular, I don't know. But my invitation to you is to consider what I've shared. It's a lot. It's a lot. See if it inspires you in any kind of way. See if there's something that shifts in your way of thinking about God and the world. See if there's some part of your reading of Scripture that becomes true in a different way, that moves you closer to who Christ was 
and moves you closer to the service that he calls us to. See if there's something in all of this that opens life up a little bit more for you and find your truth there. Because all Scripture is God-breathed. Amen.